Leslie Fleuren lives in the Netherlands where she advocates on behalf of the world's fishes and ocean life. This year she spoke at the International Animal Rights Conference and at World Day for the End of Fishing and also participated in vigils, marches, and other fish-friendly events. Leslie is hoping to connect with others around the world who recognize that fishes are sentient individuals and who are also working to spare them unnecessary pain and suffering. Thank you so much for taking the time today, Leslie. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you for this opportunity. Oh, definitely. It's so cool that we can connect in this way. Yeah, yes. we're really lucky that way. So I'm interested in knowing how you became vegan, like what inspired you and how long ago was that? Well, I think uh, I thought about it throughout my life i um in the first place i was uh, not i was not a vegetarian i eat, ate a lot of meat and a lot of fish too i guess and um but i started to uh, think about that we use animals for everything and it started with me with using uh, beauty products um and i thought well then don't need to be tested on animals and I don't need them to need products that are derived from animal products for food well I was thinking well okay you need food you know uh, but they don't need to be in all the things I touch but later on uh, then, then suddenly I realized that that wasn't enough and you heard more and more and more about uh, the impact on the environment and that made me realize that I wanted to uh, adopt a vegan lifestyle and I think this was only three years ago <laughs> so, uh, yeah afterwards you always regret that you didn't realize it sooner but isn't that true <laughs> that's the hardest yes. part about being being vegan they say is trying to figure out why everybody else isn't and the only yes. regret is that we didn't do it sooner that seems to be very common yes responses yeah and 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 so did was there a lot of support where you are is there a good vegan community um well yes i it helps that there are so much uh, online options to connect with people uh, i connected through facebook to other people um, and find vegans in my local area and uh, I've, of course i found other people on facebook and then they invite me to join a vigil and well so i learned it to to meet vegans in real life and now i have some vegan friends <laughs> yeah cool that's yes. awesome and are your are your f friends and family do they sort of accept this change in your life um yes i'm very happy my husband did accept it because he is uh cooking most of the time and always uh does the groceries or most of the time um and then I had to tell from one day on the other that I wanted to go vegan. So I didn't know how we would respond to that, but he was quite okay with it. I said, we can take time. We can take some months to to do the transfer, to eat more uh, plant-based. Uh, and so we did, and he uh, eats together with me. He's not totally vegan like I do, but... Um, uh, he eats everything I eat. So not so, yet. I would call them yes. pre-vegans, right? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. And so then it was on your honeymoon. I think you said that you went and you, and that's when you were really inspired by the fishes. Yes. Um, well, I always was interested in ocean life through, uh, I always w loved to walk on the beach and see what I could find and what it was telling me about it. Um, and I learned snorkeling when I was 12 years old. Um, but um, when I was on my honeymoon uh, two years ago, we went to Egypt and for the first time in my life, I saw coral reefs. And it, that was so amazing. Of course, I've seen it on television and stuff like that. But to see it for real is a really great experience. And we saw turtles and 
even dolphins and uh, it was very exciting and um, but when we returned to the hotel every evening uh, we had dinner there of course um, but there was also a lot of seafood being served uh, while these fishes swam you know a hundred meters from us and um, I was already involved in animal activism at the time and I realized I didn't do much for fishes um, there I promised I would do something <laughs> you promised the fishes at that point yes yes that's, that's really cool it's so beautiful I, have you ever been scuba diving um yes uh I don't have uh, a diver license or something like that but uh I did this um uh three times a dive that they they take you with them you know um that, that's very beautiful too um it is and it's so cool isn't it to be immersed like it you realize it what a whole different world it really is like everything moves at a different pace and yes yeah. yes but i think that you already experienced that with snorkeling uh, as soon as you put your head below the surface then all everything else disappears <laughs> yes and did the fishes respond to you did they come check you out and see who you are and are they just um, doing their thing? in in egypt not that yeah and some fishes do uh or at least are not scared of you they just uh, swim very close to your uh, diving mask and, and and they swim around you um but I don't think there is real interaction there. I think they are used to the tourists swimming there all the time and they are just doing their thing. Um, but in uh, the Netherlands, we started to explore our Dutch waters before, because we weren't able to travel this year. And then you see that uh, fish sometimes check you out. Yes. Um, first they are a little scared what you are going to do here and then they swim close up to you and then they just continue what uh, what they were doing um so yeah that's that's nice but sometimes often uh, they also swim away or something like that sure they just they want to see who's this big fish in our yes. waters here and so in the, the waters around the netherlands um then is not coral reefs i'm guessing is it is are there kelp uh, beds or no no i don't think so um we have a salt water lake in uh, in the netherlands and there you have oyster banks and uh, they're overgrown with all kinds of life like sponges and uh plants and other animals um and there are a lot of fishes and shrimps and uh crabs uh so it's it's very beautiful to to watch that but we also dive in fresh water uh and then it's just merely plants and sometimes uh, mussels um but that's a whole different landscape it's not uh, not comparable. Really? Yeah, I haven't really uh, done any freshwater um, snorkeling or diving. It's quite different, hey? Yes, it's quite different, uh, but can also be beautiful if you have uh, plants on the water. Uh, sometimes it's just sandy and the fishing is not always that good. Um, but we have a spot uh, not far uh, from our home and it has a nice landscape with plants and uh, we see different fishes every time uh, we go there. So that's nice. That's nice. And so why, I, I agree with you that there's a, a lot of focus um, and rightly so, you know, from the vegan community uh, on the, the pigs, chickens and uh, cows that are, and lambs yes. that are slaughtered for unnecessarily for food and other things. But for some reason, not so much on the fishes. I suppose for those of us who have access to oceans and lakes, it makes it easier to remember that they're there because they do, they live in this whole other world, right? But wh so why do you think um, the fishes are sort of left out of the discussion a lot? Well, I think it's uh, harder to connect 
with fishes, we rarely see them uh, in their natural habitats where we don't know what they're capable of and they don't have real expressions on their faces. Um, and, and well, I think also the things we learn from uh, our parents, well, that they might not feel anything or they have short memories and things like that are common believed in the community. So um, that's harder to realize that fish are animals just like cats and dogs and pigs and cows. And of course, as a vegan, you care about every animal on the planet, but I, I think it still affects you uh, that you cannot easily connect with fishes. You, you, it's harder to go snorkeling sometimes uh, than to visit uh, a, a farm or something and to actually see the animals. Right, and and I think you're right. There, there is this real misunderstanding of um, the fish's abilities and capacity to feel pain. But I think the science is starting to, to, to reveal actually now they've done studies with fishes and they're discovering that there's more to them than we thought. Yes, yes, I'm very happy they discovered it because it helps to acknowledge that these are sentient beings. Um, so, so we very much needed evidence to convince other people, people that might think that they are not capable of this. Yeah, and they can feel pain. And, and even the idea that I think there's some saying about a memory of a goldfish where they just, it just, it's a, it just in an instant. But in fact, they have very long term memories and they can even recognize faces and, and that. All yes, that yes, that's true. And well, there are a lot of different species and not every fish is capable of everything, uh, but uh, every fish have a, a set of skills and they can remember things, they can learn things, uh, uh, but, but usually they, they learn the things that they need to survive. Right, right, that's true. When we, when we look at animals often, I think we, we measure their intelligence compared to the things that we need to know in our brains. But the things they need to do with their brains are, are different, right? And if, if they were to measure our intelligence in their world, we probably wouldn't measure up there either. Yes. Yeah. They can do a lot of things we, we can't. So uh, sometimes they have a, a different way of a vision. Um, you have these fishes that have what they call four eyes, but uh, they can partly see under the water and partly see above the water at the same time uh, so that they have a complete perspective of their environment. Um, we cannot do that. <laughs> you either above the water or you're underwater. Uh, so cool. And, and also I've heard you mention that, you know, when we talk about fishes, we talk about like there's so many diverse species within just the category of, of fishes. Yes, and there are 33,600 uh, species of fish. And it's, that means that uh, uh, of all the vertebrates, they cover 50% uh, of that. And other vertebrates are mammals and birds and uh, reptiles. Uh, but 50% of all those species uh, of vertebrates together uh, are fishes. And we usually talk about fish like it's just one kind of animal. Uh, but uh, they are so different. You, uh, uh, a seahorse is something totally different than a white shark or something. It's, it looks different and it has a whole different life. And, and that makes me think about um, bycatch. Um, you know, when somebody goes fishing for a particular species, they may end up taking a lot more. Yes, yes, the, the, that's a big problem within fisheries. Um, uh, of course, they're trying to do reduce the bycatch but um, 
it's still there. Uh, they, they catch a lot more uh, species than, uh, than just the target species. And this can be other species of fish, but this can also be turtles or dolphins or uh, even birds uh, that try to steal the fish. So as the net, the net goes down and then it's coming up out of the ocean just with all these other creatures and the birds maybe get trapped in there, I see. Yes. And um, do, you, do you know, um, like, uh, let's talk, talk some more about bycatch, like which, which fishing industries are especially, um, uh, should we be concerned about with regard to that? Oh, uh, well, the most well-known fishery with a lot of bycatch is the fishery for shrimps. Um, uh, when fishing for shrimps in, in tropical waters, um, the bycatch can be as much as 80%. Uh, I've seen pictures that uh, they, they empty the nets uh, on the boat and you really have to look from what was the target species because you see so many species in that net and you have to know that they're fishing for shrimp to 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 know this because um, there are a lot of animals in there and what do they do with the other stuff with the, the non-shrimps for example do they throw them back or are they already dead or um sometimes they're thrown back and a lot uh, do not survive, of course. Um, but sometimes um, they keep the bycatch and they try uh, to um, make a f fish meal or something from it uh, that they can uh, add to food for um, livestock or for uh, farmed fishes. Right. Um, okay. And um, so in terms of, of fishing, um, how, how does fishing like, and gill net, what are the gill nets about? Oh, gill nets are uh, nets that stand in the water. They uh, are like a wall with holes in it and uh, the fish needs to swim right through it. And then they get stuck with their heads, uh, usually with their gills in the net. That's why they are called gill nets. Um, Yes, so they're hanging there uh, till the net is full and uh, they come to uh, collect fishes. But of course, they are also um, attract other uh, predatory uh, fishes that, that try to, to eat them, uh, of course. So, and so they're just, they're left for quite a while like that and then the fish are fishers come back and get them maybe once a week or something like that or I don't know I I, I don't know exactly but I uh, think that's also depending on uh, what species they want to catch okay um, and then so uh, when we look at an aquarium and we see all those beautiful fish that that is actually really we should be concerned about that right yes um, there um, there, there's a difference between pet trade and uh, commercial aquariums uh, because commercial aquariums uh, often have marine fishes. Of course, you can also uh, have this at home. Um, uh, a lot of marine fishes are catched from the wild because they're not e able to breed them in captivity. I think about... Um, 90% of the marine species that are kept in aquariums um, are taken from the wild. Uh, for freshwater fish, um, they can breed 90% in captivity, but in both cases, these fishes um, have a long way to go before they end up in your aquarium. Um, they put them in, in, in plastic bags with very, very little water and uh, they transport them from place to place and sometimes they are left there for weeks and then they go to another uh, port or uh, some facility where they hold them uh, before they end up in the store and eventually end up uh, at your home and well 
not every aquarium is quite suitable to for keeping a fish uh, and they still do this uh, so yes it's very very traumatic a traumatic uh, experience uh, i guess for a fish like that and of course uh, a lot of them die along the way and I imagine it would be really, imagine going from the ocean, right? The huge, huge ocean into a little tiny aquarium. That wouldn't be much fun. Yes, it's, that's horrible. Yeah. And um, which, with the, the, the way they catch the fish on the coral reefs is also a problem. Um, on a, in a lot of places, they're not allowed to use uh, cyanide to uh, stun the fish uh, but it, 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 it they still do this and, and that makes it easier to collect the fish from the coral reefs but even if they don't use it uh, you can imagine that if you try to catch fish on a coral reef also the coral reef can get damaged uh, by trying to catch them with, uh, with cyanide how do they do that yeah, they put it in a bottle and they swim to the fishes they want to have and then they open it and they, um, yeah, uh, then they pour it in the water uh, and then the fish get stunned and then they're easier to collect. Oh, yeah, that couldn't be good for the reef. Uh, yeah, you're right. No, no, it isn't. No, mm. no. And, and that's why uh, in, in, in a lot of places it's forbidden, but... Uh, in a lot of areas where things are forbidden, people still do this. Well, I suppose it's it's tough to monitor what's going yes. on under the ocean. Yes. Yeah, what people are doing. Um, and then, what what about aqu aquaculture and and like fish hatcheries? I think I think are intended. Uh, you know, at least on the surface, they seem to be about helping the fish. You know, they're hatching the little eggs and trying to help them head out to the ocean. Um, what do we know about hatcheries? Well, uh, in the first place, I think they set up these hatcheries to uh, restock populations in the wild. And hatcheries are good in producing fish, but they are bad at helping the wild populations. Uh, often they are a threat to the wild population. Um, and I think the reason why they set these hatcheries up are is ridiculous in the first place, because uh, they they uh, set up these hatchery, hatcheries to keep on catching fish, because that was the main main purpose. Uh, they they want uh, anglers to go to the area, and that and they have profit from uh, the people that come there. Uh, so to hatch fish to catch them later, I think this is a very stupid thing to do <laughs> and does not help, uh, help the fish, of course. Uh, but it's also a threat to the wild popu populations because uh, in nature, when fishes lay eggs, they usually lay hundreds of eggs and just a few make uh, make it to become an adult fish um, but in hatcheries they breed all these eggs and uh, there's not really a natural selection of course they try to improve this but um, it's not as good as nature can do that uh, and there is a quite a good documentary about this. It's calling artificial. Um, if you want to know how this works, it's not a really nice documentary to watch because you see how they get the eggs out of the fish. They they catch a wild fish and they hit it on the head and they cut it open to get the eggs from the wild fish and uh, and also of course with the male with the sperm. And, and then they bring it to the hatchery to, to breed them there. So it's not fun to watch. And uh, the outcome is that uh, these hatcheries almost 
were the reason that the wild population there got extinct? Because of the uh, prop, because of the competition aspect. Uh, yes, and also because of uh, the the gene pool, uh, oh. the the genes of the hatched fishes are uh, more weak than of the wild populations, and of course they compete with the wild populations also uh, for for food or for spawning areas. Um, so they are threat to the wild fish in in different ways. Uh, if they breed with them, their uh, genes also get weaker. I see. Okay, that's interesting. And um, fish farms, you know, we, we have a fish farm situation here on the coast of British Columbia. And um, a, lot of, a lot of folks, including First Nations communities, are very concerned about what's happening, the diseases that are, are, are being bred within the fish, uh, the fish farms and then being released out into the wild. Um, yes. Uh, is that is that also? I think that's also Norway's known for that too, right? In the Netherlands, yes. do you have them as well? Uh, well, we have uh, some some fish farms in here, but they're not uh, open fish farms. Uh, so they, in most cases, they have no connection to the to rivers or uh, to the ocean. Uh, that's different from the open net pens that they have in Norway. Um, there, everything you put into the pens also ends up in the water. And these fishes live in very crowded pens with um, a lot of fish. And also the waste of the fish p pollutes the area. Um, and of course, they have a lot of parasites and diseases and they try... Uh, sometimes with chemicals or other treatments to get rid uh, of it, uh, but none of that is good for for the ocean, of course. Right, and so I think you you said at some point that you have um, eel farms in the Netherlands. Yes, uh, unfortunately we do have it. Uh, we have less than we had before. Um, but we still have them and um, the demand for eating eel has not declined. Uh, the supermarkets banned them from their stores, but uh, people can still get it in fish stores. Oh. You, yes, you can still buy it quite easily because every city and every village has a, a, a market or a, a fish store where you can buy eels. Huh, I, I don't think that's a thing here. I, I've never heard of people eating eel. Um, I guess, do they use it also for, for medicine or something or is it just purely consumption? I think it's mostly just consumption, oh, yes, yes. All right. Okay, a, a different uh, stuff, every different country, I guess. But I think, you yes. know, the oceans are all over the world. So what we this idea of protecting the fishes is really a global situation, isn't it? Yes, of course. Uh, in every area, you have different species that are uh, in danger. But um, every area has them. <laughs> and every area has the, the problems. And... Well, we talk about different seas and oceans, but in fact, it's just one ocean, of course, and fishes migrate uh, through the borders. Uh, they uh, don't care about uh, the way we have set up the borders or from which country is which she or something. <laughs> Right, and 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 why why should we care about the fishes? You know, I, I've I've heard um, Paul Watson from Sea Shepherd say that once the fishes are gone, then the humans are gone. And is is that a part of your awareness too? Yes. Um, well, the ocean, uh, fishes included, support uh, all life on Earth because. Um, 50 till 70 percent of our oxygen are uh, generated from the ocean and they also absorb 30 percent of our co2 emissions 
Um, so yes, we are very much depending on the ocean as an ecosystem, but then this ecosystem needs to be complete with, uh, with the fishes in it. Yeah, the fishes are a very important part of the, the food chain in, in the ocean, for sure. Yes. Yeah. And so you mentioned that you're volunteering with the party for the animals in the Netherlands. And I think Canada now has a, a, a animal protection party. And I think various different countries are starting to have these um, organizations. And so what can you tell us about the party for the animals? Uh, yes. It, well, it's not a very big party yet in the Netherlands. Um, they have three seats in um, uh, I'm not sure how you call this in English, uh, but there are 150 seats and we have three of them Wow! Uh, in the you, opposition. You, can, I, can I just interrupt for a moment? Do you have um, uh, like a, a fair electoral system where you rank um, the people that you want to vote for somehow? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're, and, working, and we're working on getting that in Canada and we believe that once we get that system, then we'll be able to have more of a coalition. But so I'm curious, do you know how long it's been that way and, and how they got that fair voting system? Uh, no, I used to know, but I'm not very good at remembering uh, years and data. So it's been a long time though that you've had this electoral system. Y yes, uh, f longer than I live. Wow, yes, yes, that's yes, amazing. Yes, yes. Okay, so yes. sorry to interrupt. So now you've got this coalition with three representatives from... Yes, uh, I think we have, I don't know exactly, but over 10 uh, parties and uh, the party of the animals is one of them. Uh, and most parties are about to become bigger and uh, maybe to uh, become in a coalition with the, so they can uh, make the laws and uh, stuff like that uh, or that they can deliver the next prime minister because if you're the biggest the chances are bigger that you can get that kind of, of power, power right. yes uh, but the party for the animals is about influence uh, so they bring a lot of subjects concerning the environment and animals. Uh, they bring it into the discussion and uh, they uh, talk to also to the other parties to um, make them aware of things. Uh, and sometimes you see that an ID that they raised uh, is taken over by another party. Uh, but that's okay with us because the most important thing is that someone will do something and uh, if that party is bigger and uh, manage to uh, to make it into a law then then that is great that's awesome and um, and so yeah just having the voice at the table I think you know it makes a big difference even if they don't have the power to enact the laws, they can introduce legislation and hope that other people will pick up on it, right? Yes, but if yes. you don't have that voice at the table, then there's nobody there, right? So that's really cool. And so um, when you volunteer, what, what kind of things do you do? Do they do outreach to the people or? Uh, yes, well, this year was a bit different, of course. Um, but uh, we organize events. Uh, you, you can think of uh, screenings that you show a documentary or uh, you can have uh, presentations with people that uh, can tell something about uh, subjects that we are concerned with. Um, and uh, sometimes we are out on the streets, uh, especially with the elections, of course, and then we talk to people where we stand for. Um, so this can be different things. And Maybe. what kind of what kind of responses do you get when you're speaking to people out in the streets? Uh, well, it seems to get better. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, uh, of course, people think it's ridiculous to have a party for the animals, uh, um, but people are beginning to understand uh, that um, 
it's important to care about our planet because that's actually what it is about. It's called Party for the Animals because they want uh, animal, animals to be the center of everything and not humans to be in the first place at all times. Because if we do what's good for animals, then we do things that are good for the whole planet, including the human beings. Yeah, and humans are animals too, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. They've been neglected for too long. And, and I think, you know, we've seen in, our, in the area where I live, certainly environmental campaigns where we're trying to save a forest and they, and they discover a species of uh, marmot, for example, a little, a little mammal that lives in the forest. And then they can say, well, we need to protect the forest for this mammal. And then suddenly people have something they can cut, you know, imagine cuddling a cute little <laughs> creature and, uh, and that makes it easier to protect a yes. forest, right? So similar, but I guess fishes are, have a disadvantage there because they can't, they don't cuddle, like you say, you don't, you know, they're, they're sort yes, of- Yes, and that's them. very hard. And I think that's a uh, part also of the problem that, um, animal activists and also uh, organizations that care about nature and the environment uh, they are starting to uh, to talk about fishes in the oceans uh, they do that for quite some years but um, it took time for people to realize it's important and it's still a long way to go Okay, well, I appreciate the work you're doing because we got to get there fast. We're kind of running yes. out of time. Yeah. So, um, all right. So now we understand a bit more about uh, fishes and, and where we can go to get uh, more information about them. You also recommended a documentary called Sea Spiracy. It's a short documentary that's very revealing. Um, what about um, pollution? You know, we're, we're learning that we shouldn't uh, be using straws because they might end up in the ocean, but there are bigger issues with ocean pollution than that, right? Yes, um, of, of course, uh, plastic is a, is a big problem, but also uh, fishing nets uh, that are abandoned, like ghost nets, are a problem. Uh, a lot of uh, fishing boats lose their nets in the ocean uh, and they still trap animals in there and they die unnecessary. Uh, but there are a lot of ways to pollute the ocean. Uh, you can also imagine that waters from the land uh, that is polluted with, with chemicals we use on the land. Um, uh, is flowing through our rivers, through our oceans. This is especially also uh, a problem in the Baltic Sea. Uh, they have uh, a conference about this, I think next Monday, um, because it's a very polluted sea. And um, there's also a problem with our CO2 emissions. Uh, our our ocean can absorb about 30% of it, but because we harm the ecosystems, it's uh, harder to do this and we produce more and more CO2. So this means that the oceans get more acid and uh, acidification is a very big threat to our oceans because uh, acid is a threat to everything that has a calcium in its structure. So it's a danger to coral reefs and for to shellfish. Um, so yes, that, that that's a big issue. So things like um, thing, I'm thinking of things that people could do, like switching from chemical fertilizers. Just I think the stuff that people use on their lawns, even that runs off into the yes. ocean or the lakes. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and then there are fish alternatives and some very delicious fish alternatives. I mean, I must say that salmon was one of the last things I gave up when I uh, moved to become a vegan. And they're just, they're so delicious. I used to kind of joke that, you know, it's kind of their fault because they're so delicious. But I, now I'm a more sensitive vegan. I don't make that joke anymore. But 
So I get it. You know, I get why people um, eat salmon. And certainly it's a very important part of the culture in this area for traditional people. And we've learned that, in fact, the forests are so lush and green. We have temperate rainforests because the bears will drag the salmon carcasses and, and deposit them in the forest. And then all those nutrients have, have enabled us to have these beautiful ancient forests. So we certainly understand, you know, the importance of, of the fishes, but there are now fish alternatives. And I think it's interesting watching the vegan food movement grow and how each, their very localized companies are kind of springing up and offering different kinds of burgers and chicken fingers made with plants and, yes. and fish products too. Do you have alternatives? Yes, um, not as much as, as we have uh, substitutes for meat, uh, but we have um, uh, things that look like fish sticks and uh, fish burgers. Um, and so, uh, recently, uh, they came up with some a vegan sushi alternative for uh, um, uh, salmon and tuna that's used in the sushi. Uh, and well, the taste is not that great, but if you marinate it with uh, soya sauce, uh, uh, soy, soy sauce, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, then it tastes quite good. And it's 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 interesting that it turns out it's the algae actually is I guess it has that kind of fishy ocean taste, right? As I think yes, uh, you can also gain this taste from seaweed and especially from nori. Uh, it yeah, has a very fishy taste. Um, I often make uh, a no tuna salad with um, um, oh, a chick a chicken peas, I think you call them. Uh, chick pies. Oh, chickpeas. Chickpeas, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I add nori to it and uh, you add uh, the ingredients that you would add to a normal tuna salad and then uh, it, it really tastes good. Cool, yeah. And it's good and we get a little bit of iodine from the algae. And, and that's, you know, when fish, when people take fish supplements, um, the, the, the fish uh, get their nutrients from from the seaweed, from the kelp yes. and the algae, yes. right? So we don't need to eat the fish. We can just eat the algae ourselves too. Yes. And if you want to take supplements, there are also supplements with algae in it uh, for your omega-3 resource. Right. And also fish apparently are very high in mercury. So if you're, you don't want the heavy metals, which is very unfortunate for the fish, you know, that's not a natural thing. Yes. That's from all the pollution, I guess, that we've put into the ocean. So they absorb it. And I've heard they're really high in cholesterol too. So for people who are, more and more people I think are concerned about their health. So eliminating all those animal products, including the fishes is a good idea. Yes, I, I think you can uh, be perfectly health, healthy with a plant-based diet. There's more and more evidence to prove that yes. for sure, yeah. Okay, so um, next up, I'd like to just talk about, um, as we as we go move to close here, um, it, it just where, you know, if people are inspired, uh, especially people who live on the coast, let's say, and they, and they are near water and they want to get involved, um, where, where would you send them? And because uh, you've got a page called Visionbelagen, did I say that right? Visionbelagen. Uh, and, well, it's a Dutch word. Um, if you translate this to English, it means something like fish interest. Uh, so we care about everything that is important for fish. Uh, so also other life underwater and also about the water quality and things like that. Uh, it's just an initiative from me and my husband uh, that uh, we are developing this year. Um, we made uh, footage uh, from our snorkeling trips. So we were filming the fish and uh, we want to uh, make this more educational. Um, and if possible, we like to take people to go with us for snorkeling. Uh, but that's a bit hard in the Netherlands because the water often is too cold. Uh, you can 
not swim comfortably without a, a, a suit or something. Um, that's why we make this footage to show to people and to tell about it. Uh, and uh, we also do presentations if people ask us and they, these can be in Dutch or in English because we also have, uh, especially from the vegan community, there are a lot of international students there uh, that um, are also interest, interested in animal activism. So a lot um, of, uh, of these uh, presentations are also in, in English. Uh, but we also want to reach out to the Dutch people and also to uh, organizations like uh, organizations that care about oceans in general. Uh, most of them uh, will not say uh, don't eat fish uh, and we would like to ask them why. Um, uh, things like that. Um, um, I think when the snorkeling season ends, we want to develop a website with more information uh, in addition to our YouTube channel uh, where we upload uh, our uh, videos. So yes, we just want to reach out to people to show uh, that fishes are amazing animals and that's uh, that they learn to understand them better. Right on, that's awesome. Okay, so on Facebook then is the best place. Vision Blogging, is that right? Vision <laughs> Blogging. As it starts with a V I S S E N B E L A A N G E N. Okay. And um, is there anything that you'd like to say before we go? Well, uh, of course, um, um, most. Of your the people who listen to this uh, might not live in the Netherlands. Uh, it can just go out there to check information on the internet on uh, fishes and watch beautiful doc documentaries and also the uh, the ones that uh, address the problems. Uh, but if you're able to go snorkeling uh, in the waters or diving, uh, if you can make footage to show to the world, I think that can be a very effective way to uh, teach people about fishes. Um, and, in, and maybe in some areas that's easier than in ours. So <laughs> if you're able to do this, then, I, then it would be good. Well, you know, we also have cold waters here, and yeah. but I've heard that that's where there's most variety of of sea life, like or well, a lot of variety because there's a lot of food in the cold waters. That's why yes. a lot of fishes travel to the colder areas. So it's kind of you know get the wetsuit, I guess, and and, yes. Uh, yes. and then what you have an underwater camera, I suppose. Yes. Uh, uh, now we just have a GoPro and during my uh, holiday I bor borrowed a camera uh, that can make more close-ups of uh, fishes and other small creatures and I like to buy it next year. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, collecting f footage is a part of what we do and also takes quite some time. <laughs> But awesome. it's also fun to do. Yeah. And I think that's, that's important too, because you can go on about telling um, all the problems with our oceans, but people need to understand first what the fish is like. And uh, they, they need to make a connection first before they start caring. So uh, I think that's a good thing to, to do. Uh, but you can also uh learn uh, about fishes maybe you could also start to read about them you had an interview with jonathan bokombe and he wrote that book of what a fish knows and it's a very nice uh book and it tells you a lot of uh, what fishes are capable of um so that that is also a way to get information 
Yeah, and he has a really active Facebook page as well, Jonathan. Yes. That's a great book, lots of great fish stories. I know I was amazed to learn about some of the things that fishes do in their lives and how they attract mates and how they um, compete within each other. The males will build really elaborate structures to attract the females. And, and then there was one about how the females um, in some places are the males as well. And they hold the babies in their mouths yes. to, for protection for up to like a month. One yes, of them. and they cannot eat and they just do this to protect uh, their offspring. It's amazing. There's so much going on there, yeah. And thank you so much for taking the time today to share your findings with us and much good luck to you and your quest to save the fishes. Yes, thank you and uh, thank you for this conversation.